Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place to be spoon-fed the latest and the greatest of emergency medicine. We are trying to keep you up on the latest literature, and we're trying to make that as easy as possible by spoon-feeding you the latest research. Now, let's take a quick look ahead at everything that we're about to be covering. First off, we usually praise EFAST, but let's take a pause on that one. Second, pre-hospital, are you going to tube them or bag them, which is best? Third, one thing we're sure doesn't work for back pain. Fourth, is fentanyl in the emergency department making patients' pain worse once they leave? And then fifth, heart rates and acute PEs, is that a predictor of mortality? This is the audio version of the past week's summaries, which this week were brought to you by the GLAD, Megan Hilbert, Aaron Lacey, Jonathan Brewer, Sam Parnell, and Clay Smith. Now, without further ado, I bring you the first article titled, Not So Fast, Chest Ultrasound Under Diagnosis Traumatic Pneumothorax, out of the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery. Now, we've seen before that POCUS outperforms a supine chest x-ray in trauma for the evaluation of pneumothoraces, at least by way of sensitivities. And this makes sense. I wouldn't have expected to see much that would overturn this data, but these authors actually found something different than what we normally see. So let's take a look at that. This trial was a retrospective study done at a level one trauma center where they had registered sonographers and they were present to do a complete ultrasonography of trauma, CUST, as the acronym goes. Uh, they did these exams on trauma patients. Let's talk about what they found and then we'll talk about how they found it. They saw that chest x-ray was 43% sensitive for a pneumothorax and ultrasound was less sensitive at only 35%. I'd like to comment that both of those sensitivities are kind of not great. This was the opposite of the author's hypothesis, and honestly would have been the opposite of my hypothesis as well. So let's practice the opposite of confirmation bias, and because this is counter to what we thought previously, we'll dig real deep into the methods. It's not a good practice, but we do it anyways. Now, only the studies that had pneumothorax confirmed by CT were included in this study. Another concern is that when the authors point out that the plural views were not universally performed with the same rigor as in a prospective study designed specifically to detect nomothoraces, well, when even the authors are admitting that, then that worries me a little bit. If you're not doing the evaluation with intent, then why'd you pick up the probe? That said, assuming the publishers didn't just want to be controversial, I approve proof of negative data being published that goes against the grain. And that said again, the methods of this paper aren't perfect. It was retrospective, and getting a chest tube within eight hours of presentation doesn't necessarily mean that your ultrasound was a false negative. In a spoonful, I love to see things that question my beliefs. But this study... Well, it shouldn't overturn your practice, and a Cochrane review on the topic that says that POCUS prevails, well, that's still going to be my base assumption. And then the second article titled, Pre-Hospital Airway Management for Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Arrest, a nationwide multi-center study out of the COSARC Registry, out of the Journal of Academic Emergency Medicine. All right, so here's another study looking into what kinds of airways we should be focusing on in the pre-hospital setting. This is a really important part of pre-hospital management, which is done by our EMS colleagues, because they have to make the decision as to exactly what they want to do. It's not a benign decision either. We know that first pass success rates are linked to mortality. So even deciding to make that first pass is an important decision. This was a retrospective study of over 9,600 adult cardiac arrests of a medical nature from Korea. So after controlling for clinical differences in three different ways, they found that there was no difference in neurologically favorable survival at 30 days if the patient had an advanced airway, like an ET tube or a supraglottic airway, or if they were just ventilated by bag valve mask. Now, if you compare just endotracheal tubes to bag valve masking, then endotracheal tubes were better for neurologically favorable survival by about 12%. 
This finding was not present between supraglottic airways and bag valve masking. Now, so with that in mind, then it's not actually that surprising that from this study, endotracheal intubation was superior to supraglottic airways as well. Now, we've covered this before, so we should be able to put this article into a bit of context. There are studies that show every different permutation to be superior to one or the other at some point in time. And when the literature is that inconsistent, I mean, you have to know that we really have no idea what's really best. In the end, the higher quality literature seems to support that any airway management technique is pretty much equivocal to the others. So the best one is probably whatever you think is most reliable in that specific situation. In a spoonful, this study shows that endotracheal tube intubation was the best airway management strategy for pre-hospital airway management, at least if you're looking at 30-day neurological survival, which is probably usually the best thing to look at. But you have to keep in mind that this is just one paper. And then we can move on to the third article titled The Relative Efficacy of Seven Skeletal Muscle Relaxants, an Analysis of Data from Randomized Studies out of the Journal of Emergency Medicine. One of the beauties about treating low back pain is that there are so many options. Now, of course, one of the downsides is that pretty well none of these options actually work at all, and you might as well just give some NSAIDs, which actually do work. And of course, you should not just sit there binging Netflix specials all day. You gotta get up off of your couch, unless you're watching Netflix from a treadmill or maybe a Peloton. That said, I often see muscle relaxants being prescribed in the emergency department. So let's have a look at some evidence. This article was a planned secondary analysis of data from four randomized studies on acute, non-radicular low back pain. All these patients were enrolled from the emergency department and followed up on one week later. They used the primary outcome of improvement as measured by the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire. All the patients received NSAIDs, and then on top of that, they were divided into two groups based on the different muscle relaxers they received, or if they just got a placebo. And guess what? There was no significant differences between any of the groups. Any of the groups. None beat placebo, and none beat any of the others. On top of that, there was no association with age, sex, or baseline severity of their pain. This sounds like there's no benefit to muscle relaxants, at least not on top of NSAIDs. Although I'd like to mention that I would like to see longer follow-up periods on these patients, but all the same, this looks quite negative. In a spoonful, a secondary analysis of four randomized trials revealed no effect with the use of muscle relaxants for low back pain. Surprise, surprise. And then the fourth article, which holds the title of Association Between Fentanyl Treatment for Acute Pain in the Emergency Department and Opioid Use Two Weeks After Discharge out of the American Journal of Emergency Medicine. Pain is never simple. Life's just not that simple. So even though fentanyl is used to treat pain, it's been associated with hyperalgesia, which is a higher sensitivity to painful stimuli which would in turn lead to more opioid use, you would assume. It's not a complicated, vicious cycle to kind of sniff out of there, so we'd best look into this one. Now, this is a nice little study. They had two prospective cohorts of patients who were all treated with opioids for painful conditions, which lasted less than two weeks. They were all asked to document 14-day pain medication diaries to track their usage of opioids. These numbers were then converted into 5 milligrams of morphine tablets equivalents for a comparison between the different groups. Now, 91 of these 707 patients received fentanyl during their emergency department stay before being discharged on some other form of opioid. And they did not show an increase in their use of opioids over the next two weeks if they got fentanyl. In fact, they actually used a little bit less, 5.8 versus 7 pills for 5 milligram pills of morphine. But this was not statistically significant. I'd say that unless your patient reports a funny history of not reacting well to fentanyl or that in the past it's increased their pain, then I would go ahead as normal with your fentanyl as you see fit. 
in a spoonful in this relatively small prospective study, there was no evidence that fentanyl usage in the emergency department increased your patient's requirements of opioids over the next two weeks for their painful condition. And then finally, we have the last article, which is titled Heart Rate and Mortality in Patients with Acute Symptomatic Pulmonary Embolism out of the journal Chest. We sure give PEs a lot of airtime here on the journal feed, and I think that that's fair because we think about PEs a lot in the emergency department. PEs are a dangerous thing, or at least they are, I mean, they're a potentially dangerous thing. So risk stratification is an important part of their management. Guidelines recommend that we use risk tools like SPSC or BOVA scores. Now, both of those scores use hemodynamic parameters, namely heart rate and blood pressure, as part of the scores. And these are obviously important things to consider. I mean, we call them vital signs for a reason, but we don't actually know the exact association between heart rate and the clinical outcomes of pulmonary embolisms. This study was done with prospective data from the RITI registry collected over 20 years since 2001. That means they have a very large sample of 44,000 non-hypotensive patients with the diagnosis of acute symptomatic pulmonary embolism. Now, they used a hierarchical logistic regression model to determine the relationship between heart rate and clinical outcomes. And as you might expect, 30-day all-cause mortality and PE-related mortality were both significantly higher with rising heart rates. Every step up by 10 beats per minute accounted for a fairly significant change in outcomes. So let's do a quick example. Using heart rates of 80 to 99 is kind of our reference. Now if we compare that to the next range of 10 higher heart rates, so that is 100 to 109, then those had a higher odds ratio of mortality, and that odds ratio was 1.5. Next 10 up from that had a 20% higher mortality, and then another 20 after that. And if these patients had lower heart rates, then you actually see the opposite, less death. They have a nice little graph of this relationship, which kind of just shows it sort of curving upwards. But I would have expected more like a U-shaped curve, where high and low heart rates would both be bad news, but here it looks like they went even down to 30 beats per minute, and it just kept getting safer and safer, which, I mean, that starts to sound a little bit fishy to me. Now, they even went one further, and you can even play with the heart rates used in the SPSI score to improve its sensitivity or specificity. All in all, I'd say that it seems like a good idea to keep a healthy wariness of pulmonary embolism patients with tachycardia. In a spoonful, this large study on prospectively collected data, which is to say this is pretty much just a retrospective study, anyways, they found an association between elevated heart rates and increased mortality in acute symptomatic PE patients. And that wraps up our five articles for this week. Let's do a quick review just to reinforce everything that we learned. First off, negative results for POCUS versus chest x-ray and looking for pneumothoraces in trauma patients. But I wouldn't throw away your probe just yet. Considering all the data, POCUS is still probably more sensitive. Second, a pre-hospital study favoring endotracheal tube intubation as the airway management of choice. But in the broader context of all the literature, there probably isn't one technique that reigns supreme. Because at the end of the day, ventilation is ventilation no matter how you're getting it. Third, low back pain patients need education on expectations, and they should probably get some NSAIDs. Likely not worth bothering with muscle relaxants. Not even diazepam. Fourth, pain who? There was no hyperalgesia detected after being given fentanyl in the emergency department, which is great because I love me some fentanyl sometimes. Not for me, for my patients, usually for short procedures. It it has its indications. And then fifth, there's a pretty robust relationship between an elevated heart rate and the risk of mortality in patients with acute symptomatic PEs, which is fair. This is pretty much the patient's shock index. Now, links to all the articles summarized can be found at journalfeed.org, where if you haven't already, please 
go ahead and subscribe to our newsletter. And then that way you can get daily spoon feeds through your email and then I'll reinforce them in an audio format at the end of the week. Our goal here is to provide better patient care through spoon feeding. And so we're hoping to help you keep up with the latest research one spoonful at a time. Thank you.